Well, I'm Shelly. He's Jim. We're not actually joined at the breastbone. And we're really glad to be back here. Um, it's always a treat to come back. First of all, it's cool. <laughs> and uh, Birmingham, we, where we are now, is not cool. But it's also cool in another sense and warm as well. So we're glad to be back. And thank you for having us. And Jim and I were talking uh, last night uh, trying to figure out how to share. I mean, we have wonderful stories. The people who've been involved here and who've been around Ground Zero are all wonderful people and there are incredible stories and funny stories and moving stories and all kinds of stories. But what tends to get lost when we tell the stories is the reality that Brian was talking about, which is that it ain't always easy. And there have been many times when Ground Zero hung by a thread or by you know, one person having the energy to keep going, or two people coming from far away, just on a wing and a prayer for no discernible good reason uh, to pull us out of, out of a slump. So you know, we can tell all the stories, but remember that behind the stories, there's what Joan and Denny and I were calling the drama, you know, which is all the disagreements and the fighting it through and waiting it out and hanging in there and trying to stick with it and do the best we could to tell the truth. And um, I'm sure that still goes on. We're far enough away that we're not always, or mostly not privy to it, but I know any community has that. And uh, it's not like the good old days had no problems, you know, and everybody just immediately got along and agreed and did cool things and had a great time. <laughs> so just to say that as a preamble. Um, in fact, um, the early Paci Ground Zero grew out of the first Pacific Life community, which grew out of resistance to the Vietnam War. Uh, Pacific Life community was founded by a bunch of burned out Vietnam War resistors who really didn't want anything else to do with nonviolent action <laughs> because it had been so debilitating and so hard on our family life and our just general psychological survival. Uh, to spend the time and energy we did in the way that we did, resisting the Vietnam War. And there was a Catholic worker house in Seattle, and Jim and I were up in Vancouver, BC, and we all knew each other from uh, anti-war work, and we were all kind of uh, burned out, good word. So we weren't doing that kind of work anymore, and the war was over, so you know, it felt like that was all right. And into the middle of this kind of depressed and depressing scenario came somebody you've already heard of many times, I'm sure, Robert Aldridge, who had been a witness at a trial that uh, we had in Hawaii for some resistance actions that Jim and two other people did against the air war in Hawaii. And that's a whole other long story, which we won't go into. But uh, Bob Aldridge had come to that trial as a witness. Uh, back in those days, there was, or as a, representative. In those days, there was a group called the National Association of Laity. Um, these, these were the heydays of the Catholic Democratic <laughs> Movement. And it was, kind of, it was sort of a lay union. And they took all kinds of progressive stands and supported good work. And they had sent a representative to support us in the trial of the Hickam Three, who were on trial for felony charges uh, for pouring blood in the Air Force Base there. And so Bob Aldrich came, he was the representative, and we had um, the equivalent of the speaking that you had around the uh, trial that Lynn was part of, where after the court we'd go and we'd hear the expert witnesses in a public forum. And uh, Bob was supposed to just read this little statement of support one night, and before him spoke our international lawyer, who was talking about how the anti-personnel weapons that we used in Vietnam were a war crime and how we had an obligation as citizens to oppose that kind of war crime. And then, Dan, I think that night Dan Berrigan spoke too. He read a poem about anti-personnel weapons. And then, you know, this, that was the evening really, but Bob was supposed to get up and read this little statement. And he got up and it was a big auditorium at the University of Hawaii. And he went to the podium and he kind of, you know, shifted and cleared his throat and then he went and sat down. And we thought, boy, this guy this is the most stage fright we'd ever seen. <laughs> uh, 
But we were involved in the trial. So we went through the trial, and we had the verdict, and people got sentenced to probation, and that was a long struggle. And we didn't think a whole lot more of Bob Aldridge until a couple of years later, when we were living in Canada, and he called, I think it was, and said he wanted to come and visit us. And we said, sure, that'd be nice. So he came up, and he told us this incredible story. He said he didn't have stage fright that night. The reason that he couldn't talk was because he was designing a nuclear weapon, the Trident. He was designing the re-entry system for the Trident in uh, Santa Clara at Lockheed. And as he listened to the testimony about anti-personnel weapons, he realized that he was a bigger war criminal than anybody at Hickam because of what the Trident would do if it was ever used and because it was a first strike system, which was new at the time. So that's why he couldn't talk. He had just suddenly had this overwhelming conviction that, my God, that's me, you know. So what did he do? He didn't go home and get drunk or, you know, climb the ladder. He went home and he and his family, and Bob and Janet were good Catholics. They had eight or 10 kids. I forget how many, they had a lot of kids. The oldest ones were in college and Mark, the youngest one was like three or four at, the point, at that point. And Bob had been the breadwinner and Janet had been the homemaker and that was their division of labor. Well, they went uh, that Advent, as, as a family, they went on retreat together, and they all came together and decided that they didn't want their lifestyle if it had to be supported by designing Trident. And so Bob quit after, I don't know how many years, a lot of years at Lockheed, and Janet went back to work teaching, and they took a major cut in their income and their lifestyle, of course, because a weapons designer at Lockheed makes a heck of a lot more than a teacher. And as a family, they decided to do this, and they carried it through. And so Bob came to visit us and told us this story. And we were, of course, very moved by it. We hadn't heard it as many times as some of you have heard it. But it was very moving. And then Bob said, and do you know where the Trident system will be home ported? Oh, <laughs> we never heard of the Trident system. And he said, it'll be near Seattle, Washington. Well, we're in Vancouver, BC which is practically, you know, for all intents and purposes, next door. And then he took off and went home. <laughs> and there we are, you know, stunned, because he's handed the ball to us. You know, the ball's in your court. What are you going to do with it? So what we did was we called a meeting at uh, the School of Theology, Vancouver School of Theology, where I was studying. It was in January of 75. And the Catholic worker folks from Seattle came up, and we gathered some folks from Vancouver. And we talked about, you know, how do you live with this kind of knowledge and do something meaningful about it and not kill yourself in the process? Because we had come close in a, at least a spiritual way to killing ourselves in the process during the Vietnam War. And what we came up with after several days of discussion, we decided we would live and experiment in nonviolence because we felt, first of all, uh, Bob was an example to us, well, for two reasons. One, he was the designer of the missile and he was the one who blew the whistle on it. And two, he led the way by the simplification of lifestyle that made it possible for them to leave that kind of work. So there were two things right there. The Trident defends our lifestyle. So if we're gonna keep the lifestyle we have, we need Trident to defend ourselves. George Kennan said that, he didn't say it about Trident, he said, we have to realize we're 6% of the world's population and we're consuming, I forget what, 35 or 50% of the world's goods and so we're gonna have to defend it and stop all this balderdash about building democracy. You know, the point is we defend our stuff. So we thought, well, the only way we can get, really get out of this, we didn't just wanna stop Trident and have them build something else. We wanted to figure out a way to live that we wouldn't need to be defending our lifestyle with any kind of weapons. So we had a commitment as a community to a two-pronged experiment in nonviolence. One side would be personal transformation along the lines of Gandhi and transformation where we tried to understand our own interior tridents, our own interior violence that made us oppress each other, racism, sexism, you know, all of the isms that we talk about. And the political side of the experiment would be a public witness against the trident. And so we would meet uh, on one side of the border or the other every month, 
and anywhere from 10 to maybe 30 people would come to those meetings and we would hash out some issue of personal violence and nonviolence. <laughs> we, uh, this was the olden days, you know, things were, the women's movement was fairly young yet and uh, we would do things like give everybody so many matchsticks and when you didn't have any more matchsticks you couldn't talk. <laughs> and it was amazing, you know, how quickly the men couldn't talk <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> But that did two things, you know, it, it kept the men aware of how much they talked. It also made us aware of how much we counted on being able to say, well, we didn't make that decision, you know, so if it goes wrong, it's not our responsibility. So we did that sort of thing. And we planned education, uh, civil disobedience kinds of actions, resist resistance, all the things that we thought would raise the issue for people. And we were a very small community taking on the U.S. government and Trident Weapon System. We had, we had no money. Uh, most of us in, in uh, Vancouver, we had a community house called Shanti House, and 10 of us who were the primary PLC people lived in that house, and we all worked four or five hours a week and pooled our income, and that's what funded the house and the work that we did, and we had the kids, we shared uh, childcare and stuff. So we didn't have a big budget <laughs> for this campaign. But we, at that time, had a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of hope because we thought if we could follow Gandhi's way of a campaign that experiments with the truth of a whole revolution, not just the government, not just putting some, somebody different in power, but getting rid of the power over and making it a circle, a power with, sharing with, then there was really hope for the world, some kind of change. And so we did all kinds of things to try and experiment with that. We, uh, <laughs> we had the trident monster. I, we brought some pictures of the trident monster. It was uh, poles with rope on them as long as a trident submarine, which is two football fields more or less, and it had a plastic garbage bag on it for every warhead. And we marched that through, first through downtown Vancouver. And, you know, it's quite a lesson to try and maneuver something that's two football fields <laughs> long <laughs> through a street, you know. So it was, it was a very big thing, and there was a march and a rally and Trident Concern Day in the city of Vancouver. And then we brought it down to the Peace Arch, Peace Arch Park at the border, and we had interdependence days at Peace Arch Park, and Joan and Denny were there. And uh, we brought water from each side of the border and mingled it and Herb Gilbert, the Venusian, oversaw. He had uh, gold horny things coming up in a big cape, and he called himself the Venusian. And he oversaw all the mingling of the waters of the United States and Canada to make peace. And then we brought the Trident uh, Monster down here. And we went to Tinian Gate, which is up the road. It's evidently no longer used as a gate because it's all blocked off. And we cut the fence, and we took Trident home into the base. So, of course, that was re civil resistance or disobedience or whatever you want to call it. And people were arrested and we had trials and we did all kinds of defenses and rallies. And we went to jail. Um, at the, in those days, we were going to the county jail, primarily King County Jail. We did that twice, I think. We brought the Trident Monster home. And the, se the second time, we uh, had an overnight camp out and people camped along the fence. And, you know, the base was kind of worried because we'd already cut the fence once, so Roger Strittmatter, I believe, and maybe Suzuki Shoney, sat up against the pillars of the gate all night by the fire, and they had files behind their backs, and they filed the fence posts. <laughs> so the next morning when we were ready to take the Trident Monster on the base, they leaned on the fence, which went down. So that was, that was helpful. <laughs> So these were all things, you know, obviously we're, we're nipping at the heels of the, the empire, you know, we're not uh, blowing things up, but we were raising the issue. We got a fair amount of coverage for that, and we had a lot of educational backing. I mean, we did our homework. We really studied the arms race and the Trident system and what it meant and what it meant to the arms race and to world peace, and we were able to talk about that and write about that. We did a fast at the BC legislature to try and get them to take a stand against Trident using Canadian waters. And we actually had uh, approval of all the legislators to do it, but it, whoever was in charge kind of tabled the motion, so it never got called. But it was a very um, helpful and moving experience, and it educated a lot of people about Trident 
when we first started talking about Trident, people would say, well, what's wrong with sugarless gum? <laughs> you know, what's the matter? Um, but after maybe two years, people knew. And we got to the point where we would come down here to the base, mainly from Seattle, Vancouver. People would converge here for big actions, and we'd have a big march. We got to know uh, Dorothy and Jerry Peterson, whose farm was being taken over for the freeway, and they were supportive, and we tried to support them. And we would use their land for the march and uh, come and people would trespass on the base and that was civil disobedience and there would be trials and jail. And it was really very exhilarating to do all that. You know, it was like standing up for what we believed, kind of being out there in public and taking a risk for what we believed. And we realized eventually that we weren't relating at all with the people here in Kitsap. And that in fact, we were looking at Kitsap people as the enemy. I mean, we didn't see the, the then Soviet Union so much as the enemy. We were feeling enmity with the folks who lived along Clear Creek Road or wherever, and they were feeling that for us. And we found that out especially strongly one summer. What year was that? 77. 77. We did what we called Bangor Summer, which was a takeoff on Mississippi Summer. You might remember that, where people went south to register voters. We borrowed some land that was down um, on Highway 16, because that was the closest land anybody would loan us. And we had a camp out all summer, and we did workshops on nonviolence and sexism and racism and all of the issues. And then we would come up here and hand out leaflets to the workers and vigil outside the old main gate, which was the gate at that point. And we got to talking with local people, and we found out that just because we came here a lot, it didn't mean we were transforming anything in terms of creating this sharing and egalitarian revolution we were talking about. So some of us in PLC started talking about, we called it owning a piece of the rock. <laughs> we thought, well, maybe we need to be neighbors rather than invaders of Kitsap County. And um, there was a, an initial Ground Zero collective that was, I think, nine people. Joe Maines was one of them. Uh, John Williams, if you know John. Um, the two of us. David and Lucia Smith Mueller. Uh, Ruth Hood from Bellingham. A very good bunch of folks came together and we came over here. We, of course, we had no money. You know, <laughs> you don't have money when you do this. But we came over here and we looked for land. And we've, we found one piece of land that fell through, and then we found this piece of land, 3.8 acres sharing common fence with the Bangor base. And we sent out a letter saying what we wanted to do. And we got some very interesting responses. We found one um, from the Berrigans when we were cleaning out our stuff to come here that said, well, we don't really think this is a good idea. You should be in the inner city with the poor. <laughs> so, but we, a lot of people did think it was a good idea. And of course, Dan and Phil changed their minds after a while. But uh, we were able to buy the land, um, and we came down to use it as a, kind of like a summer camp, maybe. We'd come down and organize and be here for a couple of days or a week or even a couple of weeks. And eventually we realized that's not being a neighbor. You know, you can't be a neighbor if you're not there. So uh, at that point, Bob Aldridge, gave us another kick. He came to visit us and said that he was really worried because he kept trying to tell people Trident is a first strike system. It's meant to start a nuclear war, not, not to defend. It's not your destruction when you're doing Trident because it's so accurate and so highly explosive. The only reason for that kind of capability is if you're trying to hit the, si the missiles in the silos before they're fired. And that's a first strike. So he was feeling very discouraged because he couldn't convince the peace movement that this was a whole new thing and that we should be really concerned and get more active about it. And so Jim and I talked about it and we thought, well, what can we do to respond to that concern? And the only thing we could think of was, well, we can move to Kitsap County and sort of be the, the toehold, I guess you'd say, for Ground Zero in Kitsap County. So we did that in 78. Uh, we came down and we stayed in the funky old house um, while we look for a place. And we found a little trailer over in Seebeck that we rented. And our son, Tom, who was first grade then, went to school here. So we became neighbors, literally neighbors, of the folks who were in the county. And 
Tom went to school and you know I volunteered at the library and Tom played soccer and we did all the neighborly things and so we got to know folks. And because we were here, we were able to do a lot of contact building. We had, um, we knew some people who were sympathetic like Doreen Valverde who I thought might be here sometime this week, lives down in Paulsbo and she would invite neighbors in for coffee and we'd go, we, we made a slideshow. These were in the days, you know, when you, you had your mailing list on three by five cards <laughs> and you had a slideshow and each slide changed, you know, and you had to take it somewhere to get it developed, all that kind of stuff. So we had this slideshow that we had made and we'd written out a, a script and we had little red dots when you were supposed to hit the change button, you know, and we'd read it and hit the dots and tell about the arms race and about Trident and about nonviolence and our concerns and why we were here and what we were trying to do in Kitsap County. And we'd go anywhere that anybody'd have us, church group, you know, coffee group, whatever. We'd go and show the slideshow. And then we were handing out leaflets to the workers as they went into the base. A uh, different leaflet every week, which was done for years. And we were here for 12 years and it went years beyond the time we left. And that was a major kind of communication. And the workers would write back sometimes and then we would print their answers and hand them out and then we would answer and hand that out. And <clears throat> at Thanksgiving we made bread and we leafleted bread and just all kinds of things. On Labor Day, Carol Shulkin used to uh, collect uh, cartoons and we'd have like a fun Labor Day leaflet with a whole collection of cartoons. We just did all kinds of things to try and engage people in a sympathetic way but also confrontational and at the same time we were getting arrested and committing civil disobedience and the leafleting in itself was civil disobedience for a long time. They didn't want us to leaflet and it was a major issue um, getting arrested every week for handing out leaflets and going to court and arguing and sometimes serving jail time, sometimes not, but you know, keeping at it until we would kind of carved out a little space for First Amendment uh, communication. And the workers from the base would come and testify that they wanted these leaflets. It wasn't like they didn't want them. So that was all just kind of fermenting all the time together. And we were looking at Gandhi as our model and trying to figure out how Gandhi and nonviolence with total respect for the other person and looking for the truth that the other person has and yet at the same time uh, offering your life in opposition to the destruction and the violence that was going on. How does that transfer at that time to Kitsap County in the 70s and 80s? So there were lots of intense discussions and a fair number of disagreements and you know the community would split and and then people would come and then we would work some more and then there'd be another disagreement and sometimes it would split again and sometimes it wouldn't. But uh, there were many times when there were only two people or three people who were here in Kitsap to kind of carry on the full-time work of the campaign. So we just um, kept at it. We, uh, we did all those demonstrations with the um, trespass onto the base we did all kinds of trespass. We rode in, we swam in, we climbed the fence, we went on to have picnics. We, you know, there was one, uh, we used to do this in conjunction with the CBEC conference that the FOR had. We'd go to the conference and part of the conference would be planning the action and then the training, the nonviolence training. And uh, one year, after we'd done it three or four years, we had a delegation from our kids who came to us and said, this is not fair because you're always saying that you're doing this for us, but you never let us do anything. <laughs> and they wanted to get arrested too. So we thought about that and we decided, well, they had a point. So we actually planned an action where the kids trespassed with us and we had contacted whoever, I've forgotten who we needed to contact and we had it all set up so there was somebody for each child at the gate who had a form that they were in charge and we all got arrested together and the kids got released and, you know, this is very, at this point, we have quite a relationship with them, so they're willing to work with us. And uh, the kids still talk about that some, sometimes, the time they got arrested. <laughs> but we, d we just did all kinds of things um, to try and raise the issue, put our lives on the line, but not in such a way that we were hostile to the people doing the work. And as a result of that, a lot of them left their jobs. Um, some of them, I'm sure, we still don't know, but. Uh, you know, Archbishop Hunthausen, you heard about, talked about uh, Trident as the Auschwitz of Puget Sound. And not long after he did that, a guy pulled up to Jim, who was leafleting at Old Main at that time, and said he wanted to talk to him. 
And when they got together, you know, the guy said, well, I'm Dave Becker, I'm the chaplain, the Catholic chaplain at, Tri at uh, Bangor, and I want to know how do you live as the chaplain of the Auschwitz of Puget Sound? And he wound up quitting. Um, for a long time, he, would, he stayed in the Navy as the chaplain to the Prince of Peace Chapel on the base. And he would give a sermon. One week, he'd give a very kind of confrontational sermon about the Sermon on the Mount and peace and everything. And the next week, he'd be very conciliatory and pastoral. And he'd go back and forth as a, as a process to try and raise the issue. And eventually, he did leave the Navy. And he, I think it was Dave who burned his commission here at Ground Zero. We had a ceremony for him when he left. And there was, who else, Daryl Thompson, who came to a gathering at Doreen Valverde's house when we first moved here, and was quite hostile to all our facts and figures, and got called out on an emergency halfway through our talk. And we found out later that he worked in the weapons area, and the emergency had to do with the weapons. <laughs> we didn't know that at the time. And um, two years later, I think it was Doreen told us that one of the confirmation classes at the church in Paulsbo had had um, Daryl Thompson come in and talk to them about the trident and the just war theory and how nuclear weapons could be justified as, as part of Catholic teaching. And she said it was really interesting because, you know, he gave his talk and the kids listened and they had some questions. And finally, one kid said, well, if you were out on the submarine and you got the order to push the button, would you do it? And she said, Daryl was quiet for a long, long time. And then he finally said, yeah, I would do it, and then I would probably go crazy. And we didn't hear anything from Daryl for maybe a couple more years. And then uh, he called, called the trailer, I think, and said, I want to ask you to pray for me because I'm leaving my job. And he quit, and he was unemployed for a long time, but um, never went back to Bangor and works in peace-oriented stuff now. And we found out. Um, he was a Eucharistic minister on the submarine. And kind of the final thing for him was when he realized that the key to launch the missile was in the same safe as the host. So it was just like boom. And that was what, you know, that's when he decided to leave. So there were all these incredible stories, um, incredible people uh, doing amazing things <laughs> on no money, <laughs> just on faith, and uh, living here. Jim and I bought the Trax house, and I have to say, I did not want to buy the Trax house. I did not want to move closer to the Trident base. I did not want to live over the tracks where the weapons would go in. Uh, I thought Seabeck Highway was just fine, thank you very much. It was a nice, nice distance from the base, nice mountains to look at. But um, it's pretty hard to say no to Jim when he's determined, so we wound up moving and living in the tracks house, which I think now is empty, down by the um, railroad tracks gate of the base. And that was when we began to see the trains going in. Uh, we knew about the missile motors, a solid fuel propellant coming on trains, and then eventually we realized the white train was coming with the nuclear weapons. And so we had that whole uh, process of organizing a community along the tracks was going on. And we're always just looking at this stuff and thinking, how can we respond just as human beings, how can we respond to this horrible stuff without losing our humanity? And so we were always meeting as communities. We made all our decisions by consensus, which sometimes almost killed us. Um, we shared childcare. We did, you know, just all the things that you can do to try and make your life human. And there was one other thing I was going to stick in there before I hand this over. What was it? Oh, the pagoda. Da. Um, Almost in, as soon as we came to Ground Zero, there was a young uh, Buddhist monk from Japan named Suzuki who came with us. And we would do things like uh, we Christmas caroled for the neighbors, and we, people went door to door and greeted the neighbors, and Suzuki would chant. And one day Suzuki came, and he was really excited. He said, Guruji, who was the founder of his order. Now, mind you, we're totally ignorant. We don't know who Guruji is. We don't know what the order is. We just know that there's this nice guy named Suzuki who's with us. And uh, Guruji and all these monks and nuns are in New York at the UN, and it's my chance to get them out here because I think Guruji will want to build a peace pagoda here at Ground Zero because of all the tridents. And he's so excited, you know, you can hardly understand him. So we're thinking, oh my gosh, what are we going to get ourselves into here? But we said, okay, um, Guruji, good, we'll host Guruji. So the night Ronald Reagan was elected, 
we had a gathering here with Fuji, Nichida to Fuji, Guruji, who was sort of like the embodiment of St. Francis in this century for Buddhists, and a bunch of monks and nuns, and this very weird eclectic gathering of, I don't know, Mennonites and Catholics and Quakers and whoever we could pull together, at the same time as Ronald Reagan was being elected. And we heard Guruji talk about peace, and he walked around, and uh, he, at that time he could walk. Um, people helped him walk around, and he said, yes, this is a good place for, the, for a peace pagoda in America because it's right next to this huge concentration of violence, which is the point of the pagoda, is to kind of counter that and be a witness to the opposite. And so Guruji sent monks. We had lots of monks here at one point. Um, we had gotten permits from the county to build the pagoda, and uh, we had a geodesic dome, which was kind of slapped together and didn't fit anybody's code. <laughs> And the neighbors eventually got very upset. And they organized Concerned About the Pagoda, which was a counterweight to Concerned About Trident, which was organized here. And they did a lot of public education, and they told people about the threat of the pagoda. And you know, <laughs> they, did, they did all the same things we did, but they had a lot more clout. <laughs> and so we wound up not being able to have the permits. We had all hearings and kinds of things. And at the same time, the first trident was coming in. So we were planning the peace blockade, which Jim will talk about. And all these things were going on at the same time. You know, and people are getting really upset, <laughs> because Kitsap County isn't this nice bucolic uh, military fortress that it used to be. So uh, we wound up without permission to build the pagoda, but we had a very strong community between the Ground Zero community and the Buddhist monks. And one symbol of that that I'm not even sure people are aware of, um, in the geodesic dome, when it was still here, we had a beautiful gold-plated Buddha that had, it was you know, maybe as big, had been sent from Japan, especially for our pagoda here, to go on the pagoda. And it was waiting in, on an altar in the dome uh, until the pagoda was finished. And we also had a handmade um, kind of modern art metal crucifix that someone had made for Christian worship here. And so they were both in the, in the dome, and we used the place for joint worship. And one night, um, somebody went into the dome and smashed all the statues with an ax, we think. They smashed them anyway, and set fire to the place and it burned down. And we were very lucky there were no monks sleeping in there because they often would sleep in there. So it was just very providential or whatever that nobody was killed. But what happened out of that, well, several things happened. One was that the people who were doing all the really hostile talking were kind of taken aback because this is what came from that kind of talking. The neighbors who were talking about how we were invading and you know we were gonna do all these horrible things realized this is what it led to. This was the obvious response was, well, kill them or burn, them to burn their dome down or whatever. The other thing was, um, since we couldn't build the pagoda, we built the stupa, which is here now, and in the base of the stupa are the ruins of the Buddha and the crucifix together. So it's like cementing, literally, cementing the bonds between these two faiths to work for peace. And uh, that's kind of where it is now, I think. I don't know if we'll ever actually get to build the pagoda, but the stupa stands there as a sign of that hope and also of the, the joint community. So I'm going to let you pick that up. The year before the, the USS Ohio, the first Trident submarine arrived was a very dramatic year. <laughs> Carol and Maria, wherever they are, will remember how dramatic that year was. Where are they? In Lynn. Oh, <laughs> they're hiding back there. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I remember a symbol uh, in the days before the Trident sub came in. Um, first of all, uh, of course, a Trident submarine, you assume a submarine comes in under the water. How are we ever going to know when the Trident submarine's coming in? Well, in, when it gets uh, coming down the Strait of Juan de Fuca and near Ground Zero, near the Bangor base, it has to surface um, for safety reasons. And um, you can see the Trident submarine at that point. But you can also see it, for example, in the um, Panama Canal. We had people in the Panama Canal area that were warning us uh, when the Trident submarine was coming. We had people 
uh, spotters up and down the Strait of Juan de Fuca to warn us when the Trident Submarine was coming. And um, there was a community building uh, in the years before that arrival of the USS Ohio on August 12, uh, 1982. That's the whole key to this nonviolent transformation that we seek. Um, because the community, as Shelley was saying, is on both sides of the fence. If it's not on the other side of the fence, as well as on this side of the fence, we can forget the whole thing. It has to be a community that overcomes this fence, not only by climbing over it periodically or cutting through it periodically and going to jail, but also by becoming one with the community on the other side of the fence. And in describing the leafleting process, that was one of the real keys to the campaign at that stage. Because as, as she was saying, when we were first coming into Kitsap County, we and they were we and they. <laughs> uh, there was this tension. There was this uh, conflict between the ro local residents and the people of Ground Zero. But things would get mixed up, you know, when we were leafleting and when we were being arrested. And at the point where the, the leaflets accepted by the, um, the base workers went from, you know, a few dozen when we started leafleting, got through the, up to the hundreds, and eventually we were passing out 2,000 leaflets a week on one day. Uh, going into the Trident base, as well as passing out leaflets at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard where Tridents would get refitted and so forth. And also, for a while, we were also passing out leaflets at the Keyport Torpedo Station. So we were getting a lot of information out and a lot of relationship building. Um, and yet, uh, also, the tensions were rising because of uh, it becoming very public, which we wanted it to be, that we were going to blockade the first Trident submarine. Blockade it. How are we going to do that? <laughs> uh, the um, way we wound up doing it was um, we had, I think, a total of 19 rowboats. Um, a number of which were built in Port Townsend. The leaf, the, all of our rowboats were, were constructed or brought to us by people in the campaign. Uh, people at Ground Zero knew <laughs> diddly something about rowboats or, or being out in the water or anything having to do. I mean, this is the United States Navy over here, <laughs> and we're a bit of land, we're landlubbers. Uh, well, some of us can't even swim. Yeah, right. Uh, so we're trying to stop the Trident submarine. So fortunately, um, we got some assistance in this process from the British Navy. Two officers of the British Navy uh, came to our assistance. And one of them was, uh, became the captain of the, he, was the, he, he and, uh, and his spouse were the owners of the Pacific Peacemaker. Uh, a ship, was it Australia or New Zealand? Australia. 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 They, they sailed their ship all the way from Australia and uh, demonstrated against the French nuclear testing in, in the process and, and got boarded and smashed and so forth from, by the, the French Navy. I mean, this is, as we know, international weapons is an international problem. Uh, I mean, the problem, uh, weapons that destroy the, uh, the entire international community. And, so the French got it first uh, in terms of the resistance of the Pacific Peacemaker. And then this, um, this boat, this Pacific Peacemaker sailboat, wound up here, captained by a veteran of the Royal Navy. He'd been in it for 20 years, and he was one of our skippers. And uh, so he told us what we had to do and which side of the boat was starboard and, you know, this, <laughs> this sort of thing. And then down from... Uh, Canada from Victoria came um, a trimaran captained by another 20-year veteran in the British Navy, um, and it was called 
the Lizard of Waz. So we had the Pacific Peacemaker and the Lizard of Waz and about 18 uh, rowboats uh, uh, to stop the Trident submarine. And the strategy was extremely sophisticated. Uh, the Pacific Peacemaker uh, had the, uh, the uh, duckling strategy uh, because um, the, there, were, there were long ropes that were going to be, that were, I mean, we practiced for weeks <laughs> in the Hood Canal and up above north of the Hood Canal because the uh, United States government declared uh, a huge area, um, a security zone. Security zones, you know about security zones. So uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't even practice down in this area. We had to go north of the uh, Hood Canal. And the Pacific Peacemaker had these two long ropes. And then the rowboats were strung up, you know, like ducklings behind Mother Duck. And so their strategy was to, for the Pacific Peacemaker to sail in front of the Trident submarine and then, let, and then uh, uh, they'd, it's, they'd keep going and everybody pulling, being pulled by the, uh, the, 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 the long ropes, they'd drop and then, and then try to, would stop because of all these duckling boats. So that was number one strategy. That was Pacific Peacemaker's strategy. And then the, the Lizard of Waz strategy was sort of, uh, uh, I guess I'd call you, call, it was called kamikaze. So we would, we would just, the Lizard of Waz would go right in front of the Trident sub, and then we had very tiny boats. They were only single person boats on the Lizard of Waz. So we'd all throw our boats into the water and jump in, and then ro roll like crazy in front of the <laughs> Trident submarine. And, uh, and then we had, uh, there were a couple of other boats that had motors on them. They were going to circle around the Trident sub and drive it crazy <laughs> by circling. So this is what we were going to do and stop the. Uh, the USS Ohio. The United States government took this seriously. <laughs> they sent 99 Coast Guard boats to stop us. 99. That was the entire Coast Guard fleet, Pacific Coast Guard fleet of the United States government. And they had these huge security zones, uh, which were, you know, it was a felony to go in these zones to. Uh, and, and the security, a moving security zone around the Trident Sub. Anywhere the Trident Sub was, there was a moving security zone in, in, in addition to the whole Hood Canal. And, uh, and then, you know, as, as, you know, we had a base camp up in the mountains over in the other, one of the mountains over the other side, and there all these, you know, airplanes were flying over us all the time, and it was, you know, you, it was either ridiculous or terrifying. You, you, you couldn't figure out which. Half the time you think it's ridiculous, and the other half it was terrifying. And there, were, there was, I, I remember on the road, you know, over here, you know, there's all this discussion about that. You know, it's going to happen soon, you know, this confrontation. There, were, there was a tank going up and down the road, you know, the, the, the National Guard. Uh, it was... And that's when, the, that's when the dome was burned, in the midst of all of, all of this, when the, when the dome was burned. And thanks to Glenn Milner, we know actually who burned the dome now, many, many uh, years later, from, through our Freedom of Information Act request. It was, you know, the, the base said they had no knowledge of anything. And uh, through a Freedom of Information Act request done by the greatest uh, investigative <laughs> journalist in the United States, Glenn Milner, who did it? Glenn, who did it? Two Marines. Two Marines on the base. Uh, and how did you find that out? I mean, what, what, what was the, what's the story? Well, what it was was, actually what happened was they sent so much information on this time period. Yeah. And I couldn't read it to you. Read it, and I gave it to you, and you found it in the stack. <laughs> <laughs> you were the ones who, who found it. But yeah, it was just an incredible... I mean, they had people in Montana looking, you know, around this uh, blockade. I mean, they were looking for people across country who might be involved in this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was... Uh, there were actually people from across the country who were, too. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, but it was two uh, twins, twin Marines. Uh, they, were, they were high security guards within the base. They guarded the nuclear weapons area, and they came in and uh, burned down the... And immediately got shipped out. Yeah, and then, then they covered up 
the base very deliberately covered up who had done it. We didn't, we, we didn't find that out for maybe 25 years or so. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's coming, get, getting coming closer to this time, and Shelley says, don't forget the rally. That, um, that was to occur on August the 8th. I looked up the date, which wound up being uh, providentially four days before. You know, we had to plan these things, of course, months and months and months in advance for a submarine that the Navy has total control over. But providentially, this rally, which wound up being attended by 8,000 people in the, uh, the tribal land north of here, um, first of all, where are we going to have the rally in Kitsap County, you know, for all the people who want to come to help stop the Trident submarine who couldn't actually go out on the water with our rowboat fleet. Um, so uh, we, 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 we were trying to find, you know, they got private property up and down galore and who, what private landowner is going to give us a site, you know, by the water for thousands of people to come. The Native American community up here did. And uh, we went to see them and they said, uh, you know, uh, this is quite a, a thing you're asking us to do, you know, to allow us to, you know, to, to permit you to use our land for a great big rally against the Trident submarine. They said, and, I, and we said, sure, and uh, how can we help you? And they said, well, we've got this baseball team. And they said, we'd like to get uh, some uniforms for our, our youth for their baseball team. Can they do the refreshments for your rally? Oh, sure. <laughs> so, so they did the refreshments for the rally and got really nice uniforms for their baseball team. And 8,000 people came in. And um, Archbishop Raymond Hunthausen, of course, who was so profoundly supportive of the Trident campaign, was a speaker. Bishop Talbert from the Methodist Church. The Church Council of Greater Seattle was totally supportive of the Trident campaign and of the resistance to the USS Ohio. They took their own boat out. They didn't blockade the submarine, but they did vigils back and forth up above. So These are the and the United Church of Canada, which is Shelley's church at that, in those days, um, we'll get t further to what they did in commissioning you <laughs> to do something. Uh, um, actually, they did that earlier, didn't they? Yeah, well, first thing they did was the, the United Church of Canada uh, commissioned Shelley to be a peace missionary to the United States of America. <laughs> and she has been ever since. Uh, she was... She would have been ordained in the United Church of Canada had she not come down here two, two courses short of her, rec her receiving her diploma at the uh, Vancouver School of Theology because she left that to come down here and to devote her life to peacemaking. The United Church of Canada commissioned her to do that. And then they sent down their boat, uh, which is a missionary boat that they were sending all up and down the, uh, the western coast of Canada. It came down here with a huge banner that said, uh, resist, try and celebrate life, and all this, and they they, uh, they anchored it off the coast of the of the ba of the base, and just hung out there for a while. So a lot of good things were were uh, were happening, and the and the tension was building. So, all right. So it comes to the day, and uh, the USS Ohio came in, and um, you know, uh, Trident is a first strike weapon, right? Preemptive war. Well. Um, the United States government uh, did a preemptive act <laughs> on our fleet and uh, all of us were um, uh, arrested, boarded, arrested, uh, trussed up kind of like pigs and um, a couple of the, the boats did circle around the, uh, the Trident submarine. We did not uh, stop the Trident submarine but in the course of the, of the uh, weeks leading up to it, the, uh, the uh, consciousness of the whole Pacific Northwest, and actually bigger than that, was raised immensely. Every day was a big story, a big story. Waiting for the USS Ohio, the rowboats versus the <laughs> United States government's greatest weapons system. So what could have been a celebration of the end of the world, basically, became a dramatic raising of consciousness 
about the question of are we going to destroy our world through this kind of thing because a lot of information got out during that period of time and people were leaving jobs and a man named Al Drinkwine on the day that the submarine came in um, a base worker walked off his job um, Al Drinkwine, Al and Jerry Drinkwine are very dedicated peace workers today in Seattle, Washington, and uh, beautiful, beautiful people. They've come down to visit us um, in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. They've been over here. They are with it. And another person who will be here, um, she might even be here tonight, later, or possibly this weekend, is Mona Lee. And some of you knew her as Mona Seahill in those days. All of these things were happening, people walking off the base and all. So we did not stop physically the Trident submarine. Well, that wasn't the point in the first place. Excuse me, Jim. Could you give a date? When was that? August 12, 1982 was the day that the USS Ohio came into the Trident base. And August 8 was the date of the, the big rally. And uh, what happened to the stage? We were using the Clallam land and uh, their tidal flats where we were, and to have enough land for all the people who were coming on a fairly narrow beach, we had to time the rally so that the tide would be out. <laughs> <laughs> so we built this big wooden stage, and we had a generator, you know, we had a sound system, we had all this stuff, and we had to keep the speakers really moving quickly, because then the tide started coming in, <laughs> and we're trying to get everybody done, and then get the electrical stuff out of the way before the water comes in. We did just barely make it, but the tide was a foot or two up the, up the stage by the time we were done. But it was all very sort of seat of your pants, and, and scary, but fun, you know? Yeah. <laughs> if you don't want to get electrocuted, be short. <laughs> and then there was the, uh, the white train um, to stop. There's the Trident submarine, there's the white train, there's the Peace Pagoda, um, uh, which um, was being uh, demonstrated against by concerned about the pagoda, and uh, who were also, folks were, they were also picketing Ground Zero, by the way, picketing our Wednesday night meetings concerned about the pagoda was. Um, it was an interesting time. And um, a, a lot of arrests around leafleting. Um, as Shelley was mentioning, people were going to jail regularly for just for passing out leaflets. They'd arrest us inside the white line for um, you know, trespass if we passed out leaflets, or outside the west white right line for uh, blocking traffic if we were passing out leaflets. Well, you can't do it in midair. So back and forth, back and forth. But because of the attitude of Ground Zero people, which is that each of the uh, members of the police department, just like each of the workers on the base or members of the United States Navy, uh, sisters and brothers, um, and since we saw a lot of them in court, you know, uh, they would come to testify against us, or in some cases to testify on our behalf because they wanted to receive the leaflets even if they didn't agree with them. Um, we, we've developed relationships and the Kitsap County Police wound up non-cooperating with the United States Navy because they realized they were being exploited. I mean, uh, they, the Kitsap County was having to pay the, the, the bills for all these arrests and uh, we weren't against the Kitsap County Police. In fact, we were telling them when the tr trains were coming, when the trains started coming, we were trying to help them with uh, their arrests, which was for on us. <laughs> Uh, and the base wouldn't tell them anything, you know. And um, so the base, uh, the, the Kitsap County Police said, we're not going to arrest them anymore. So we could then pass out our leaflets outside the base. And then the base kind of gave up and allowed us to pass out leaflets inside the base. So, the, you know, you have to struggle for your rights. You know, we're supposed to have constitutional rights. Fight for them. <laughs> That's the only way you get them. So um, the... the uh, Trax House, which Shelley and Tom and I moved into, um, our son Thomas, who was in grade school here and was taught by Dirk Gleistein, um, uh, Mary's brother. Um, 
we moved into that house after knocking on the door for, I'd say, about a couple of years or so, and uh, asking, are you going to rent or sell your house? Whoever lived there, we would rent, you know. And, you know, what? No, we want to rent or sell our house. And eventually, knocking on the door, there was nobody there, and we traced the owners over to um, uh, the east side and across Lake Washington and uh, found them and asked them the question, yeah, we are selling it. And, you know, we did the same process as at Ground Zero um, and were able to um, purchase the house, which had been owned originally by the, um, the, the guy who was in charge of the whole railroad, the station master. So it was a, the house right over the tracks coming into the Trident base. One reason to get that house and was to, to have our eyes open, to have our eyes open. We didn't know exactly what we were going to see. We knew that there were there's some, I mean, it ended up in the Trident base. So we knew something important would happen. And then we started vigiling and we saw first the, the missile motor propellants, these highly propellant uh, weapons that uh, uh, Glenn has been doing huge research on and that have huge, huge explosive arcs. And uh, the Agape community formed all along the tracks back to uh, the Salt Lake City, Utah, and the Hercules, for, uh, Hercules Corporation that built those weapons, the missile propellant fluid. And then one day, uh, we, were, we received a phone call from a reporter who said, you know, I saw a strange train up in Everett, Washington coming south, and it, I think it had probably had some weapons on it, and you might want to check it out because I've heard you live by the railroad tracks there. And we received that call one morning, and um, I walked down the, the, the stairs, the steps in front of our house, right to the railroad tracks, which, are, which were less than, there were 67 feet, I think, 70 feet. We were actually inside the Trident Base part of our house. They had, you know, had not surveyed the land properly. So the, the phone that we received the call from was actually on the Trident Base. So, and as I got to the bottom of the, of the steps, there was a train coming in. A heavily armored, all-white train. December the 8th, 1982. Um, a few months after the peace blockade. And what on earth is this? Boom, da da boom, da da boom, da da boom, da da boom. And these huge cars within, you know, after the, these long, low, white cars, uh, heavily armored, everything heavily armored, and these great big cars that uh, had turrets on them, like a tank, and slits in the sides, and things would stick out at you, you know. And um, what on earth is this? That was the white train, and our first time ever seeing it. Uh, first time even knowing about it. Eyes, vision come depending on where we put our lives. If we get drawn into a question deeply enough to follow it, to the point where you knock on the door and the door is opened, your eyes are opened. And that was the beginning of the, the tracks campaign, the stage of the white train. And of course, what goes in, you know, like a mouse going into a, a hole, comes out. So by the time the train came out, thanks to a man named Tom Rawson, whom you know because he's a great artist of song, um, who is also a railroad buff and who knows all the tracks all across the United States, we'd set up a network of, along all of those tracks. Follow the train. Where did it come from? So when the train came out, we traced it back to Amarillo, Texas, to the Pantex plant where all the nuclear weapons made in the United States are assembled. And from that point on, we tracked every train that came north from there to the Trident base and a woman named Hetty Sawatsky, a very dedicated Mennonite woman, she put her life on the line by moving to Amarillo, Texas to live there and watch for the train full time, leaving that plant so that she could begin the process of phoning 
hundreds upon hundreds of towns and cities along the tracks on all the different possible routes. And that's the tracks campaign. And that's how it developed over the years. And um, so then the question was, how do you stop the train? First, how do you stop the, the submarine? And we had all kinds of struggles around that, you know, because it's not a question of physically stopping anything, and yet it is. And there's this tension. When you see the white train, just like when you see the Trident submarine, knowing what's in it, when you see a, a train that is carrying six times the power of the Second World War, 200 hydrogen bombs, each of them, um, you know, capable of what uh, Dave Hall was telling us this morning, that huge, huge blast, east of each of them, the whole train capable of destroying the entire world, you get very, very, and we had very difficult questions to face on how we stopped the train. Um, that went on for years. And um, the train did eventually stop, but um, it stopped through a process of change and of nonviolence whereby we finally realized um, through the depths of the teaching of Martin Luther King, of Gandhi, of Jesus, of the Buddha, that the people in the train, just like the people in the submarine, and the people resisting the train are one. And until we become one, there is no way on earth we're going to stop that train. I think I'll stop there. Thank you.